Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Todd Enoch. I am the head of Serials and Electronic Resources at the University of North Texas Libraries. And on behalf of the NASIG Continuing Education Committee, I'd like to welcome you to our inaugural webinar, Effective Negotiation in the 21st Century from Computer Mediated Communication to Playing Hardball, presented by Jill Grog, Sarah Morris, and Beth Ashmore. I just wanted to let you know that uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to send me a message in the chat box and we'll be stopping uh, periodically throughout the presentation to address your questions. And uh, with that, without any further ado, I will turn things over to Jill. Thank you very much, Todd. Okay, so um, as Todd indicated, this is the inaugural uh, webinar for NASIG, so we're very excited to, to be doing that with NASIG Continuing Education Committee. We're going to split this up into three parts today. Uh, I'm going to start with an introduction to negotiation. Sarah, who is actually in public services, is going to come in and discuss doing your homework, and then Beth is going to finish us up with factors that affect one's ability to negotiate. So I'm going to put this on full screen. And we'll start with Negotiation 101. What I'd like to do is begin with two basic premises. First, for the practicing librarian in the 21st century, negotiation really is a given. Uh, while some of the worst elements that initially appeared in license agreements for digital content and services are less common, say like the ability of a vendor to unilaterally terminate access at the first hint of a breach, other unreasonable terms persist. But Really, moreover, negotiation is not just a skill needed by the librarian who is charged with purchasing and making available digital content. And that is how we have really approached negotiation. Um, in so far as this is a much broader topic that affects all different types of librarians, and it remains a valuable and necessary skill for any librarian because we all negotiate on a daily basis with coworkers, with employees, with employers, with funding agencies, with patrons, with faculty, etc. The second premise is that negotiation can really be intimidating. Um, but why do so many of us find the prospect of negotiation so intimidating? Uh, for starters, we find it intimidating because we don't think we are very good at it. Uh, there is an impression that negotiation is something for which one either has a natural proclivity or one doesn't. For those of us who don't feel like natural negotiators, those people who don't barter or haggle or enjoy buying a car, so to speak, uh, this kind of leaves us out in the cold. And even more importantly, we receive very little, if any, formal negotiation training in library school. So it's something that we're not trained to do. The unknown future of the information industry makes negotiation a key skill for present and future librarians. Librarians in the future will likely have more partners rather than fewer, and partnerships always and inevitably require negotiation. It's impossible to negotiate without communicating, and determining the kind of communication you will be using in any given negotiation is absolutely critical. Is it face-to-face -face or digital? Beth will be discussing these sorts of factors that affect your ability to negotiate. Also critical is understanding and interpreting the person with whom you will be negotiating. One of the reasons that different people can arrive at different conclusions based upon the same message is what's called the imposition of noise on message reception. Noise can be literal sounds, as anyone who has ever tried to carry on a conversation with an adult while a two-year-old screams in the background. But more broadly defined, the concept refers to any stimulus that gets between the message and its intended receiver. Noise could result from the appearance of the messenger. Let's say you're talking with a vendor who has spinach in his teeth. Noise can be hunger or exhaustion. It could be a preconceived belief, a strong emotion, or an entrenched value system. 
It could be apathy, it could be mental illness, a desire to win at all costs, or any number of impediments to the message getting from the sender to the receiver in a pristine fashion that the sender intended. Noise, however, is not an impenetrable wall to effective communication, and one of the reasons for this is feedback. Let's pretend that you and I are walking along a sidewalk in a busy city on a windy day. I'm a sales representative from a major vendor, and you are a serials librarian who decides what e-journal package, if any, your library might license. It is my job to make you want to do business with my company, and the bigger the business, the better it will be for me. You, however, are not an ideal receptor for my message. You had a big fight with your spouse last night. You overslept and missed breakfast. And now it's past noon and you haven't eaten all day. You are hungry, tired, sad, and grumpy. On top of all of this, the racket from traffic and our fellow pedestrians is loud and distracting. Noise of all sorts abounds. My only hope for success in our business dealings on this day at this time with this person lies in maintaining and artfully using the feedback loop which binds our communication and through the skillful use of this feedback, reduces or eliminates the noise which distracts you from my message. So let's apply the artful use of the feedback loop. Oops, sorry. <laughs> A skilled sales representative might gauge the mood and reaction of the librarian, both verbal and nonverbal, and discontinue the sales pitch. He might invite the librarian to lunch and veer the conversation towards the personal, perhaps commiserating about how, housing, how high housing prices are, say that five times fast, or other common ground. Having connected on a personal level and helped elevate the librarian's mood, he continues the sales pitch. A savvy negotiator understands that keeping the feedback loop vital and open enhances one's chance for success. So let's talk about some of the non-library world expert advice that um, we can use in our uh, quest to become good negotiators. Uh, Ronald Shapiro and Mark A. Jankowski, authors of The Power of Nice, count preparation or doing your homework as paramount. Sarah will be talking about this area, so we'll be skipping it for now. Another recurrent theme in many of the most popular negotiation titles is the need for good negotiators to be open to creative solutions. A perfect example of creative solutions is the SERU initiative or the Shared Electronic Resource Understanding, which eliminates the need for constant terms of use negotiation. Sometimes being open to creative solutions just means dropping the idea that if my opponent is winning, I must be losing. But Roger Fisher and William Urey, authors of another seminal book on negotiation, Getting to Yes, see inventing options for mutual gain as key to any negotiation. In order to seek out those options for mutual gain, it is important to ask questions. Shapiro and Jankowski offer a technique for probing called what. The W in what technique stands for why. When the other side takes a position, don't make a counter offer or disagree with their assessment of the situation. Simply ask why a certain aspect of the author is warranted or appropriate. For example, if a content provider offers a less than transparent pricing and access model, be sure to ask for clarification about how they arrived at that model. The H stands for hypothesize and encourages the reader to offer hypotheticals, which provide a chance to, to probe in a non-threatening, non-committal way. The A stands for answers and reminds us that the best answers are questions. They lead to more answers. And the final T stands for tally. Do not get so wrapped up in the questioning that you don't take time to listen to the answers and take stock. It's easy to sit in negotiations and think, this deal has to work. We don't have an alternative. However, this is almost always not the case. It is extremely important for a negotiator to recognize that every negotiation has options. Look for what the best alternative to a negotiated agreement, um, or BATNA, would be for you in a given situation. 
For example, you are in negotiations with a publisher to receive a collection of science e-journals. You know how much you can afford for these titles, and you know the standard license terms your library asks of all vendors and publishers. However, this particular publisher is known for restrictive license terms and high list prices that are well above your suggested price. Before going into negotiations, you may want to determine that your BATNA would be the cost associated with setting up a pay-per-view or document delivery service. Document delivery would allow users access, but it likely won't be as simple as a site license. Fisher and Yuri see developing a BATNA as key to going into negotiation confidently. They suggest that a negotiation, negotiator's power increases in direct proportion to their comfort with not reaching an agreement. When involved in making a deal, the experts tell us to avoid any pretense of neediness. Neediness is a no-no because it can kill leverage. Richard Shell, author of Bargaining for Advantage, Negotiation Strategies for Reasonable People, illustrates leverage thus. Leverage is inversely proportional to how much one has to lose. In other words, if you don't have much to lose, you can leverage like Archimedes. Another no-no is to avoid the reciprocity trap. Shell describes this as people who make small concessions and then ask for much bigger ones in return. We've got the air conditioning and the reference room fixed, so it's no longer 87 degrees in there, the administration says. In return, we think it would be only fair for the reference librarians to staff the reference desk until 1 a.m. instead of closing at 10 p.m. That would be an example of a reciprocity trap. Ultimately, however, tricks are for kids. Like just about any other skill, becoming a good negotiator takes practice. There are no magic tricks. Using the experts as your guide, there's no magical transformation of self, but there can be a transformation of perspective. Based on the writings of a 17th century Japanese warrior, the Book of Five Rings for Executives by Donald Krauss emphasizes that this masterless samurai urged the warrior to approach conflict with ordered flexibility, which provides a context from which to choose the appropriate action at the appropriate time. The warrior, or in this case, the negotiator, must be prepared to strike with a full understanding of the environment i.e. doing your homework, a proper attitude, concentration, and timing. Frankly, this may seem like quite the non sequitur for a bunch of librarians discussing negotiation, but I include this because there are those times when one is faced with playing hardball. Though it is less intuitive that librarians will face themselves, will find themselves in situations requiring the cool, killing attitude of the samurai, the tactics laid out in five rings apply to most any situation requiring tough negotiations. In the world of libraries, hardball negotiation frequently concerns money. We need a journal, someone else has it, and both sides want very much to protect their own interests. That is why preparation or a full understanding of the environment is vital. The wise librarian knows not only her own institution's budget and cost, but learns what she can about the publishers, what other institutions may pay if that information is available, what faculty at her institutions have contributed to this publisher, etc. With all of this knowledge, the librarian is poised to negotiate with any number of people, both external and internal, the publisher or the faculty who have grant money. Other attributes of ordered flexibility come into play here as well. Observation is crucial, as is poise, but all parts of an effective argument must be timed to their best effect. Proper timing prevents what might otherwise be solid points from being dismissed or lost in the shuffle. Attending to all these elements in a negotiation is critical to playing successful hardball. Let's look at an example shared by one industry veteran. This was a negotiation between a librarian employed by a publisher and an aggregator wishing to include the publisher's content in its products. In the mid-1990s, in the early days of digitization, publisher A had accepted a one-page aggregator contract as is 
no questions asked. Publisher A hired a new librarian, and said librarian closely read the contract. She quickly realized that while the business terms were sufficient, other parts of the contract were too simplistic and did not address all the necessary terms and conditions. She contacted the appropriate representative at the aggregator, and the two agreed on a handshake, so to speak, to meet and work through the issues together. In the meantime, upper management at the aggregator arranged a surprise meeting at a conference with both the aggregator's representative and the librarian in attendance, in essence, disregarding the original handshake agreement. By this action, the upper management at the aggregator is taking advantage of the environment, acting from a position of strength, and using surprise to unsettle the librarian and diminish the librarian's power. All of this, it would seem, is in preparation of striking a death blow to the librarian's case. If that was the intent, then the unannounced meeting was the decisive, appropriate action at the appropriate time. Trade the surprise meeting for a sword, and the librarian is cut into end of story. As it happens, the death blow was not delivered. Rather, the upper management at the aggregator backed down from the meeting after learning that a good working relationship already existed between the two parties. But the aggressive action of calling the meeting seriously damaged for a time the trust which had been carefully built between them. When one strikes an opponent, the only positive outcome is to vanquish, vanquish that opponent. In serious conflict, wounding the opponent while leaving them able to respond is never a good idea. And that would be one way to look at things. Another way would be to declare that the aggregator, realizing the reality of the situation at hand, employed ordered flexibility by calling off the meeting and letting the original negotiators proceed. Trust was restored, and in time, a mutually satisfactory conclusion was reached. It's not personal, it's just business. We hear this all the time, but I just want to emphasize that to treat negotiation with a vendor as less than a business deal is to deprive it of the respect it deserves. In a difficult negotiation, removing emotion is critical. The last thing I want to talk about today before I turn it over to Sarah is to take one or two more minutes and discuss women and negotiation. This is something relatively new for me, and as I was delving into the research about this, I realized very little, if anything, had been written about librarians and the fact that we are <laughs> overwhelmingly women and that women and men negotiate differently. Uh, librarianship is a pink-collar profession, so we, I feel like we need to address this particular topic. Let's um, talk about a few numbers. Uh, many of these are from an excellent book called Women Don't Ask that I highly recommend to anyone who's interested in this topic by Babcock and LeChevre. Um, that's not a library text, but it's just fascinating reading. So 2.5 times more women than men said they feel a great deal of apprehension about negotiations. Men initiate negotiations about four times more often than women. 20% of women say they never negotiate at all, even though they recognize negotiation as appropriate and even necessary. So what can we do to remedy this situation other than just negotiate? Uh, Dee Lee Fromm, in her article, Women and Negotiation, summarizes some interesting research. Dina W. Pravel and her team of researchers who have studied both university students and business professionals conclude that some situational triggers result in better outcomes for female negotiators, while others result in better outcomes for male negotiators. They have found that there are three main types of situational triggers, ambiguous situations, negotiating for others, and when competition is high. Let's just talk about, for the sake of time, ambiguous situations. Let's say you are entering the workforce for the first time. You have done your homework on starting salaries, but how, that, however, you find that the compensation range is not clear or does not appear to be standard. In these circumstances, research shows if you are female, the results indicate that you will likely have lower expectations about your salary than your male colleagues and that you will not negotiate the amount that is offered to increase it. 
the simple answer is men will. What's important to understand here is to recognize the differences and deal with them. I'm also not talking about physicality when I say women in negotiation. Often what's really at stake here are particular behaviors associated with gender. In addition to all the things we've talked about thus far and we will talk about next, experts recommend attending seminars or taking, taking coaching to better understand gender differences and develop your negotiation skill. Practice, of course, is the best teacher. Um, that's all I have, so I think we're going to pause at this point for questions. Yes, and so far the only question that I've gotten is will there be a list of all these articles and books available after the presentation? Yes, we have a slide about that. Okay, and that's the only question that I've seen right now. So at this point, we will uh, turn it over to Sarah Morris. Okay. Um, Hopefully this is working. Uh, I am Sarah Morris, and I am the. Um, sorry, I was checking the screen to make sure you all can hear. Um, I am an American history librarian at the University of Kansas, and so it's uh, nice to be talking with all of you at NASIG. Um, I'm from the public services side, and. I am a historian, so therefore I am a Luddite and I'm dealing with technology here. I want to remind you from the beginning that negotiating isn't new for librarians. Um, when I hear negotiation, I automatically think about money. But negotiation isn't just dealing with money. Think about the reference interview back when you were in library school, which for some of you might have been the last time that you had thought about this. But that is a negotiation. You're trying to ask questions and figure out what it is that someone else needs so that you can get to a mutually agreed to point of where they're satisfied with the material that, that the patron is satisfied with the material they have, and you are, in fact, also uh, reasonably happy with that information. So I think if you think about negotiation as a reference interview, it might help to make it a little bit easier in some of those issues that Jill was talking about. Another time that we are dealing with or negotiating is acquiring material. I am often trying to convince faculty members that an ebook will will make you just as happy as a print book now that we're in an electronic world. So try to uh, interpret negotiation in a wide sweeping vantage point. And the other thing is that I want to remind you that this isn't a new issue. In 1977, at the Clinic on Library Applications of Data Processing at the University of Illinois, 35 years ago, the theme was negotiating for computer services. And I've increased the description here, and I'm going to read this to you. The increasing use of automation in libraries has made many librarians painfully aware of the difficulty of negotiating for computer products and services. This is true for a wide range of situations, such as acquiring a turnkey system, joining a network, subscribing to an information retrieval service, and many others. While negotiation should be a give and take process between parties on an equal footing, librarians often see themselves as being at a disadvantage. The product or service is technically complex, the legal instruments are mysterious, and the other party has greater experience with technology, the law, and the art of negotiate, negotiating. So uh, again, as a historian, I wanted to find the primary source, and here, this, these difficulties that we deal with with negotiating aren't new. So the question is, how do we prepare? Now, <clears throat> William Shatner, as Priceline's negotiator, has indicated that negotiation can be done quickly and on the fly. All you need is an internet connection. However, if you miss this, it is essential to know that Priceline dropped 
William Shatner and the negotiator as its advertising campaign in January. And if you missed this, you can see his very last negotiation on the Priceline website. If you can't do it quickly and on the fly, what do we do? It is preparation that is most important. So for any type of negotiation, think back to that reference interview, it's important to understand who it is that you are working with. Now, the examples that I'm going to give you at this point all deal with licensing and dealing with a business, but I think that these are all tools and ideas that we can use in any type of negotiation. So this really builds on some of those ideas that Jill talked about. So you can see the interrelation here. The first thing going into any type of negotiation is to be prepared. You've got to do your homework. And thinking about licensing, one of the first things is what is it that you're trying to achieve? Is this a renegotiation for a product that you already have? Is this a new license? Is this a vendor that you have worked with in the past? All of these things will affect how you negotiate. Uh, maybe you've got a new salesperson. So think about these things as you are going in. And other, there are many other, influence, other factors that would influence this. What is the current state of the industry? Um, I, we gave this, a version of this presentation last year at NASIG in St. Louis, and I was driving across Missouri, and I had just stopped for gas, and I got out my phone, and I looked at my phone, and I got the email from EBSCO that they were going to acquire H.W. Wilson. That is a huge change in our industry. And for anyone who was going to go into negotiations with EBSCO or Wilson in the few months thereafter would really want to be aware of what this change in the industry was going to be like. So one thing to think about as a librarian is what tools are available to you to prepare for this. I think we're all reading listservs or possibly blogs, and these things can really inform us. But I wonder how many of you actually go and use the business resources that are most likely available at your library. If you are not comfortable with them, you could always talk to someone in public services or the business librarian because materials like Hoover's or Business and Company Research Center can tell you a lot about that company, which is going to, of course, make you more prepared to negotiate. We certainly live in an industry in which companies are merging and changing all the time. There are also free resources. Be sure to use the internet. And, and some of the things right now that are going on might even be in the Chronicle or Inside Higher Ed. So to prepare, Go and look at these sources. Another thing, or another aspect of doing your homework, isn't just knowing who this is that you're negotiating with, but are there alternatives? Jill posed the question of instead of going for the big deal, perhaps doing a pay-per-view. That is one example of this, but another would be, is, is this database available from a different company? Do you have to get it? from this particular vendor is a consortial agreement an option. So always know what your options are, which also leads to that BATNA concept that Jill presented. So once you've done your homework, um, the other thing is you have to understand yourself and what it is that your organization is trying to achieve. What, in fact, is the final outcome? Is there only one option, or is there a different option that you could um, choose? So something that I would suggest, and this is really important to utilize your relationships with people in public services, if you have a trial, 
for a product and you're in negotiations, you might want to find out, are there weaknesses? And negotiation isn't just about money. One thing that you could try to work for in the negotiation is asking to have one of the company's professional trainers come to train the folks who are going to be using it. There's always a room to ask for a freebie. Another thing is that the general counsel at your university might be able to help you in your negotiation process, but you might also need to find out what are their limits in negotiating. And in the end, the most important thing is that you've got to understand who you are going into negotiating. Jill talked about how women struggle with negotiation, and that's something that is important to understand is that you might negotiate differently and that each negotiation is going to require something different. And in the end, the more of this homework that you do or competitive intelligence, then you're going to feel more comfortable. It's just like going back to my time at the reference desk, a student who is well prepared, who hasn't waited to the last minute when every book that they need is checked out, is probably going to do better on their paper. So as you're going into your negotiation, make sure that you have an arsenal and an army of information behind you. And I'm going to turn this back over to Todd. Thank you, Sarah. And we have not received any other questions, so I'm just going to pass the ball back over to Beth to finish us out. Okay. All right. I am now the presenter. Okay. Now I just need to figure out how to make this full screen. Ooh. Ooh. Jill, how do I make this full screen? Oh, I'm sorry. There it is. Oh, technology. You're so much fun. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so I'm Beth Ashmore, and I am the uh, Serials um, and Electronic Resources Cataloger at Stanford University in Birmingham, Alabama. And I'm going to talk about some factors that affect our ability to negotiate. Um, and as Sarah just said, um, doing your homework is super important for a negotiation. And part of that homework um, is understanding the industry within uh, that we are negotiating in. Um, because it is undeniable that information is big business. And I would also add that information is weird business, but I'll explain that as we go. Um, one of the first um, things that has changed the way, one of the factors that changed the way, that changes the way we negotiate is the existence of consortia. In the face of rising prices, prices and complex licenses that accompany electronic resources, librarians have been successful in reducing both costs and administrative overhead through the use of consortia. Consortia provide leverage in a number of ways, most notably in increased buying power and shared goals among the organizational members. The upside to consortium negotiation is that with a consortium, there has to be a benefit to going through the consortium, whether it be in terms of price or preferential licensing terms, or a benefit for uh, members of the group. To quote Ivy Anderson of the California Digital Library, a consortium agreement expands access in at least two ways. By negotiating lower prices and redistributing costs, it can make resources affordable for its smaller members, and by offering cross-access to content subscribed to by other member institutions, it can make available to each member far more content than would be possible in an individual agreement. Um, in addition, centralizing product and sales communication, negotiation, billing, and administration under a single body also reduces, reduces the work for each library involved. In fact, in my experience, um, studying negotiation and, wor and uh, working with and talking to um, a lot of different uh, consortia, I would, I would say that consortial negotiators represent some of the most talented negotiators in our industry. It's also easier for consortia to walk away from a deal, um, kind of like what Jill was talking about with the BATNA. Um, if, if the deal's not meeting the standards of the consortium, um, it's easy for the consortium to say no, because it doesn't mean that the individual libraries involved won't get the resource. There's always the alternative for the libraries to make a deal 
on their own with, with the vendor. Um, the libraries always have that option or possibly going with another consortia that they belong to. Um, the ability to walk away from a deal is huge when it comes to leverage. Consortial deals also generally benefit both sides, making them tend to be more satisfactory deals than, than others. Publishers get more users and greater exposure, which is wonderful for them, and users tend to get more content. Now, there's always a downside, always a downside. The downside is that a poorly constructed consortia can drag its members off track, off track and waste resources. A common understanding exists between the members of a consortium about the goals of the partnership. If a library belongs to a statewide consortium made up of public school and university libraries, the group's mission will dictate which resources to pursue on the member's behalf. If that same library also belongs to a consortium of college libraries with which they share, they share a similar population, size, and research level, it may expect an entirely different selection of resource deals. A bad match between the resource and the consortia can be detrimental for everybody. Consortium also tend to, or I should say, consortial deals also tend to represent decreased budget flexibility. Um, when you're in a consortium and you're, and you're working on a particular deal, it can often be contingent upon certain members being in that deal or maintaining certain subscriptions. Um, and so suddenly we're reliant upon each other to hold up our end of the bargain. And this can make for uncomfortable relationships between once amicable libraries. Uh, there's also a problem of speed. Um, many consortia, if not possibly all, uh, move slow. It's just the nature of the beast. Each library has its own signing officers for contracts. Um, Greg Doyle, who's the consortial negotiator for the Orbis Cascade Alliance in the Pacific Northwest, told me a story about how when he's working on a deal for his member libraries, um, he tells the vendor up front that once uh, the member libraries have decided who wants in on a deal, the access to that, to that resource needs to start right away before the licenses get signed. And if the vendor says, no, we can't do it until everything's signed, then he says we can't do the deal because he knows from experience that it takes so long for everyone to get all the paperwork signed and all the deal done that if they wait until everything's done to get, to get the access turned on, they'll be waiting forever. They'll forget they even bought the resource. So um, it, it, can be, it can be really difficult sometimes to deal with that, with that lack of speed. Um, it can also be difficult to deal with finding an equitable cost distribution. Uh, big libraries can sometimes feel like they're carrying the smaller libraries, and smaller libraries can sometimes feel like the bigger libraries are getting to call all the shots and throw their weight around. Um, Jill and I are both in the state of Alabama, and she's at a very large library, and I'm at a kind of small library, and so uh, I'm sure that we've both uh, had this feeling from uh, each other before. Um, um, in addition to consortia, believe it or not, an economic downturn can also make for good or maybe even great negotiation. For starters, it's an excuse to re-examine those contracts, those ones that you were never happy with. Um, however, in a weak economy, everybody, everybody along the content supply chain can take the opportunity to revisit a previous agreement. So vendor and, and user alike. Um, and at that point, what you want to do is be realistic about the whether or not the market can to continue to bear those costs. Um, publishers can take this opportunity to seriously evaluate their title lists and to determine the value and use offered by each title. There's also the fact that claims of poverty to vendors are always more convincing when you actually don't have any money. Uh, if it gives you leverage, believe it or not, if the vendors know that something will get cut this year, and if they don't make a good case, it might be them. Um, it's also a time to get creative and look at those resources that don't have the usage stats to back up their reputation or, on rene or renewal anymore. Look at the resources that were acquired on a whim by someone who had some budget power, but that person is no longer in your organization. Um, how about the resources um, that you've always wanted to cut but inertia just kept you renewing them every year. Um, vendors can get creative in terms of pricing models, too, um, particularly if we ask them to. The ICOLC statement released on January 19, 2009, says in, it is intended to help publishers and other content providers from whom we license information, resources, understand better how the current unique financial crisis affects the worldwide information community. 
The statement also aims to suggest a range of approach, approaches that we believe are in the mutual best interest of libraries and the providers of information services. In, in essence, if we we don't like pricing models, if we don't like access models, the best way to get them changed is to make a suggestion. And during an economic downturn is a great time to do it. The downside, as we all probably know, in an economic downturn is that less is less. There's no two ways about it. Um, there's also an issue of your budget changes, but then also the cooperative deals or purchasing of databases that, that get affected as well. For example, here in Alabama, we're dealing with a possible cut to the Alabama Virtual Library. And should that program that fall apart uh, in the face of, of a, a bad state budget, um, we, at least at my library, I don't know about Jill, but at least at my library, we are going to have to reevaluate re our electronic resources budget entirely because we've become very reliant on certain basic databases that being provided by the whole state. Um, I know I just contacted my uh, state House of Representatives um, to beg that they not cut the ABL budget. I haven't heard back from him yet, unfortunately. Okay, so let's talk about publisher consolidation in the big deal. I'm sure that you are all just waiting to talk about that. Um, when you're negotiating for a new integrated library system or choosing a subscription agent, we never forget that there are other providers of these services. However, when you're negotiating for the acquisition of a particular journal or a collection of journals, the ability to find a comparable product can be much more difficult, if not impossible. There's this sense, particularly in the science, technology, and medical field, that each periodical, each article, is a monopoly. Think of the best article you've ever read. What would be the replacement for the, that article, for the information that it provided? It would be hard to think of one, wouldn't it? In a 2002 article from the Journal of Economic Methodology, Hank Plasmeyer describes how this works in the publisher's favor. Everyone seems to agree that an almost obligatory transfer of copyrights from author to owner of the journal is the foundation of the publisher's market power. Obviously, obviously since a scientific article is a unique product for which in scientific communications no substitute exists, the transfer puts the publisher in the position of a monopolist. So, how does one negotiate in a monopolized market? Well, for starters, you look at the numbers. Some of the research suggests that depending on who you are, for example, a health science library consortia, the big deal might actually work for you. In a 2008 article by Cecilia Batero, Stephen Carrico, and Michelle R. Tennant, University of Florida's Health Science Library saw a $12 per article savings on big deal titles over document delivery. With the big deal, that gets bigger with each publisher consolidation, more really can be more. Publisher consolidation also creates fewer platforms for users to learn and fewer platforms for librarians to manage. Finally, a big deal via a consortia can prove cost effective and collection smart because it spreads journals from various fields across many institutions that may need those different fields. The disadvantages of the big deal are becoming more and more the topic of talk lately. First, we have the decreased budget flexibility that we talked about with the consortia. Um, but it also kind of moves over into the area of collection development. Big deals have a tendency to restrict conscious, deliberate collection development that libraries pride themselves on doing. There's also the question of sustainability. Um, Bernstein Research's report, Read Elsevier, the Inevitable Crunch Point, downgrade, downgrading to underperform because of growing concerns on Severe, published on March 10th, 2011, quotes Research Libraries UK Executive Director David Prother saying, we do not wish to cancel big deals, but we shall have no alternative unless the largest publishers substantially reduce their prices. The report goes on to say, the big deal commercial model worked well for over a decade, but is becoming unsustainable in the current funding environment. Universities which have started to renounce their big deals seem able to cope, and this experience, coupled with budget pressures around the world, represents a significant threat to the big deal model. Now, don't go calling your lawyer just yet about the unsustainability um, and uh, about uh, antitrust, but <laughs> some economists 
and legal experts like Plasmeyer and Aaron Edlin from the University of California, Berkeley, have acknowledged that the unique scholarly communications market and the youth models like the big deal bring up some interesting antitrust issues about what it means to be a barrier to new entrants into the market, as well as pricing that is set so high that it's raised above competitive level. Economists like Plasmeyer also cite that librarians play a big part in the weirdness of the scholarly communication market. Because in our striving to create a seamless access environment, we inadvertently make pr users price insensitive as well as price unaware. And this fosters an odd economic environment. Uh, it reminds me of a scene in the television show Arrested Development. I'm not sure how many of you are fans of that show, um, starring uh, Jason Bateman. Um, and uh, essentially what happens in this scene is that Jason Bateman's character uh, earlier in the episode had refused to give his brother a free frozen banana from the family-owned frozen banana stand, uh, thinking that his brother should pay for his bananas just like everyone else. Uh, later in the episode, Jason's mother gets mad at him and disagrees and finds uh, this lack of brotherly charity very annoying and says to Jason, what could a banana possibly cost? $11, $12? To which Jason's character responds, have you ever been in a store? Um, this is a good example of price insensitivity. Mrs. Bluth, Jason's mother, uh, she, she doesn't know how much a banana costs. And honestly, neither do our users. They do not know how much we pay for the resources we provide them. Um, and so we're making our users inadvertently like Mrs. Blue. We offer them huge amounts of scholarly communication without ever communicating the cost behind this material. Um, in addition to that, we don't know what a reasonable price for a scholarly article is. Is it $10? Is it $20? Is it $100? Does it vary based on the article? Probably. Um, it's tough to know because most of the consumers of this information are completely unaware of the prices and they're completely insensitive to them because they rarely have to pay the bill. This means that in addition to negotiating with publishers, we need to negotiate with our own user communities to give them a sense of what responsible and sustainable scholarly communication practices are and, and responsible and sustainable pricing so that when we have to say no to a deal because we know it's unsustainable because we know it, it simply cannot work for our budget or for our collection that they'll understand why we're saying no and that they'll advocate on our behalf with the publishers themselves because we know that they pull a lot of weight um, because they are the engines of scholarly communication okay i'm going to check my time oh we're doing good all right um so moving forward Let's talk about open access and open source. Open access and open source are a couple of movements that have really galvanized, I think, our ability to negotiate. Open access increases competition and often doesn't have the same copyright transfer restrictions that, that um, regular publishing does. And so this creates um, less of a, a monopoly for the scholarly communication products that are produced. Um, when negotiating about open access and open source, Price doesn't play as much of a factor. There are other costs that need to be negotiated that I'll talk about in the disadvantages column, but price can be one less issue to work with. Open resources can also be a driving force behind innovation. Google's relevancy algorithm has spurred all database vendors to improve the relevancy sorting of their own resources. The creativity of the open marketplace combined with the popularity of their features equals better commercial products from vendors who are watching open tools in the industry. On the downside, increased choices means more research and more factors to weigh, more homework. It can be crazy. Um, there are still things that you need to negotiate about. And some of this is internal negotiation within your own organization. Because things that the vendor used to do may need to be done in-house or contracted out to a service vendor. Think of um, open open source catalogs. Um, you lose all those vendor features that, that you rely on and, and suddenly you have to have in-house programmers and that sort of thing. Um, issues that need to be negotiated when an open access or open source um, option is chosen for acquisition is what about continued development and maintenance from the creators as well as from your own internal staff? How stable and what type of support is offered and what does it cost? How do we implement this and is there anyone to help us? 
Um, vendors provide a lot of marketing material. Going it alone may require you to pick up the slack, and you better be sure that you've talked to your reference and instruction people and that they know that this is the case. And finally, assessment. Can you get stats for this resource, and what are they going to look like? The final thing that I want to talk about is technology. Technology has changed the way we communicate, so of course it's changed the way we negotiate. Tools such as chat and email um, have given us a chance to craft our messages and maintain a record of what has been agreed to and said that you simply don't always have on the phone or in a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, I have sometimes been uh, called abrasive uh, in person, and so I find email can be a good way to take the edge off and um, I can have much more um, uh, collegial email conversations than I can sometimes person to person. Um, speaking face to face, though, um, we can still do. We just don't have to run around anymore. Sure, I imagine sales reps still do a fair amount of travel, but they don't always have to travel um, because they have the option of teleconferencing. Um, training has also been changed. Um, by the way we teleconference, and so it's easier for vendors to include more training because it can be done via webinars and WebExes and all kinds of great opportunities, and so it's easier for us to include that as part of what we want when we're negotiating an agreement. The ability to share files and markup licenses dynamically can move along a once slow and fax-heavy process to make it much quicker, and a well-populated ERMS can collate data like the best administrative assistant you've ever had and really give you the information you need to make informed decisions in your negotiation and cut down the time that it takes to do some of that homework. Um, blogs, listservs, Twitter uh, help us all to be more informed buyers and sellers, whether it be a really robust seller website that gives lots of product info, um, or buyers getting together to talk about how they got a good deal or handled a thorny issue. Informed negotiation is good negotiation. On the downside, email can take what would have been a five-minute phone conversation and drag it out over three days. Email can also be misread or marred by poor netiquette, like typing in all caps or too many emoticons. Um, having sensitive legal documents out in the cloud can freak people out, and with good reason. The value of file sharing always has to be balanced with document security. Also, revisiting that awesome, well-populated ERMS, yeah, you need to put all that information in there, and sometimes that's not easy, so there's a little bit of work still involved. Um, these are just a few of the unique factors in our industry um, that create a really exciting and dynamic negotiation environment for librarians. Um, and I want to show, here are um, some of the books that we talked about, and uh, if people are interested, we can create uh, an even fuller version of this that we can send out to everybody who's, who's come today. Of um, There's also another option for getting all of these uh, great citations, and that is a book that uh, Jill and uh, myself and Jeff Weddle have recently had published with information today. And I actually have, if anybody thinks that they might be interested in buying this book from information today, I actually have a promo code um, from the vendor that we're allowed to give to special groups of people, like the folks that have come to this webinar, um, to get 40% off um, the retail price at Information Today's um, Yahoo store. And so if it's okay with Todd, I'll just give you all the, this promo code. Is that okay, Todd? Oh, I can even type, Jill's telling me I can type it in chat. That's a good idea. That sounds fine to me. Okay. Um, how do I make this not? this anymore. I'll do it. Okay. I'll let Todd do it. Oh, return. Okay. There we go. Okay. Type it here. <laughs> okay. Promo code. Promo code. I'm typing it in the chat window. One. And while she's doing that, uh, if anyone has any questions, now is your last call to type them into the chat window for us. And while we're waiting to see if anyone uh, asks any questions, I want to 
thank everyone for uh, coming to our first webinar. I'd like to thank Jill and Sarah and Beth for being our guinea pig presenters. <laughs> and um, whenever you leave the, uh, the session, you should be redirected to a SurveyMonkey uh, survey set up by the Continuing Education Committee. Please, please, please fill that out. As, as I've said a few times, this is our first one. We would love all the feedback we can get to make sure that future webinars are um, better and stronger and all around awesome. So please be sure to fill that out. And if you aren't redirected, we will be sending out a link to it separately to make sure that everyone who has a, a paid to do this will have a chance to do some a, a feedback. Uh, someone is asking if I can display the previous screen of references. There you go. And we will be a, a sending out an email with a copy of the list to all the registrants to make sure that a, uh, everyone gets a chance to see it. Uh, I do have one question. If you're going to be sending out a copy of the slides, uh, do the presenters have any objection to us sending out a copy of your PowerPoint? Not at all. We can, we can definitely send that out. OK. So it looks like pretty much all of our questions are related to the slides <laughs> and getting copies of the references. So since there hasn't any, is there anything else, I will go ahead and say thank you once again. And this concludes our webinar. Thank you all very much. Goodbye. <laughs>